Okay, and so in this fourth part of the video, we take a slight detour uh, from uh, from just a core interest of our interest in this tutorial, which is SQL analytics, and look at a more generalized version um, of of the set of problems that we have been looking at, and which in fact is coming from the broader uh, the broader uh, field of multi-view learning. So moving on, so let's look at QA data, mm, uh, right? You have a question space, which is basically the space of questions mm, and uh, you have questions in that space and you have an answer space, right? Uh, and this is just basically the illustration from the from part one. I've just flipped, I've just, um, I've just rotated it 90 degrees and there are linkages between them. Okay, so there is a question space, there is an answer space and there are linkages between them. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. That is what is usually assumed in case-based reasoning. You can of course relax it by saying that a question could have multiple answers and so on. But uh, but the basic version is one-to-one -one correspondence. And multi and this can be seen um, or this can be thought of as a special as a specific kind of multi-view data or two-view data, um, where you have where you have a two parallel data sets, two spaces with data points in each space, which have one-to-one -one correspondences with each other. Right. Okay. So where do we find these kinds of parallel two D parallel two view data or, or multi view data? You can find these kind of data in healthcare when um, a, a patient presents with a particular disease condition and he or she might need to undergo multiple kinds of tests. One could be an EEG if the if the condition is related to some neurological disorder, and maybe the person might be subject to fMRI as well. EEG has some amount of sequential information which fMRI um, uh, may not capture in that same in that same format. So you have the same person being subjected to EEG as well as fMRI, and this is trivially uh, two view data. So this is these are two kinds of manifestations of the same disease condition in two different formats, right? EEG is one format, and fMRI is another format. And you can think of multi view, um, and you can think of um, images and text associated with them, which is abundant in the case of uh, if you're crawling from Wikipedia, you can look at images, uh, images and their captions because Wikipedia almost always enforces that images come with captions. So you trivially have the image grounding of a concept as well as the text grounding of a concept along with it. So that's also two view data. And once you start looking at two view data, um, multi view learning uh, in the, in that sense, then you can you can kind of uh, start to view everything as multi view data. So this is some data. This is a data set from the National Institute of Oceanography in Kochi in India, where uh, they are looking at uh, sedimentation within the Bay of Bengal, which is basically a sea in the in the eastern and the eastern coast of uh, peninsular India. And these are basically sedimentations, and which they have recorded in March 2015, as well as they have another recording in in November. 2015 and uh, the way to think of this is two view data could be uh, to basically grid this uh, grid the grid the region of interest and you have each of these grid cells represented in both of these snapshots right both of these temporal snapshots this grid cell uh, here has high sedimentation in the in the march snapshot but low sedimentation in the november snapshot whereas um, the, the patterns differ across across other kinds of grid cells so you can kind of grid it and you have this correspondence coming through the gridding which is consistent across both of these uh, both of these um, uh, things and then uh, you can use that use that use that correspondence to build to think of this data set as a two view data set okay so moving on uh, there are other kinds of multi view data um, from the entertainment domain for example you have movie information which is basically the cast and crew of the movie as well as you might have a movie review information as well which is basically the customer view of the movie so this is basically where the first the left hand side is the producer's view or the or the production view of the movie and the second one is the reception view of the movie from the customers from the from the audience basically Okay, <clears throat> so moving on. Um, uh, so, so basically, we, we have seen that um, um, this multi-view data is kind of very abundant um, in the real world. You find it in the entertainment domain. You find it in the healthcare domain. You find it in a, in any domain where you where you where which you want to approach with that kind of a multi-view lens. So now, um, our evolution at uh, the evolution of humans within this within this kind of an uh, within this kind of a setting where you have where you're exposed to multi-view data in various forms. Um, well, not just a modern multi-view data, but you have multi-view data when you think of when you think of the uh, different senses of the uh, senses of the human body. These are all different different views of the same thing. For example, a tiger on the prowl might just uh, uh, give off uh, some uh, give off some part of it in the visual imagery and whereas uh, you might also be able to sense it through the audio imagery. 
So the mind has evolved a, uh, evolved a very sophisticated machinery for cross view reasoning. <clears throat> Okay, and the intensity matching across views is, is particularly easy for the human mind and that is one evidence in favor of the cross view reasoning capability of the human mind. For example, you can ask questions like is John as tall as Kathy is intelligent and this is a, per this is a perfectly meaningful question um, and most humans would be able to make sense of this and, maybe, and would be able to kind of reason about it and give an answer about it if, if, if they know the people in question of course. And so uh, this example has been taken from uh, the book called Thinking Fast and Slow by, Dan by Daniel Kahneman, um, which talks about the various kinds of workings of the mind um, and in specific reference to behavioral economics. Uh, but um, apart from that, there are, other, there are other kinds of insights that this book gives you as well. So uh, let us look at cross-model matching. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and uh, uh, you, have an, you have a visual thing. Uh, in different formats you might have a you might have an image as well as you might have a lexical representation of it and the cross model matching between them are often considered very easy and very consistent so for example let's consider these two shapes one is a kite shape uh, one is a sharp edged kite kite like shape and then and the other one is a soft rounded edge amoebic kind of shape and you have these two words as well which are called kiki and boba I just write them there okay and now um, uh, the question is, uh, if you post this to an audience, of course, I don't have a real audience be here with me. So if you post this to an audience and ask them to make a one to one correspondence between these figures and the figures and the words, most of them. And, and if you're thinking about it and you might also have come up with that kind of an, uh, that kind of a correspondence, which is basically the correspondence would be Kiki would correspond to the kite shaped figure or the sharp edged figure, whereas Baba would correspond to the more amoebic shaped figure. And here in this case, a B, O, U, etc. All, all lead to short, soft edges, whereas K and, K and I have kind of acute edges and sharp edges. But that's not the reason because um, uh, this, this thing, the, this manifestation correspondence uh, happens only in English. And they tested it even with uh, Swahili speakers in Africa who were, able, who were also able to make this correspondence despite um, there being no uh, kind of lexical correlation um, uh, or in terms of the, uh, uh, well, just like we have in English. This example is also not, but um, uh, well, it's of course um, uh, taken from elsewhere and in particular it is taken from this book called The Telltale Brain uh, by uh, V.S. Ramachandran, a, a very renowned neurologist uh, who, has a, who has written a lot about, about particular neurological phenomena and so on. But um, this is something which is really interesting for, from our perspective because it says that humans can consistently and very easily draw correspondences between images and text okay okay <clears throat> so uh, i mean one question for the for the computing world would be can we build computing algorithms that imbibe such capabilities for cross view reasoning that might be a challenging task but that's of course something that we can think of so <clears throat> let's look at some core tasks in multi-view learning okay so there could be multi-view clustering which is basically taking uh, taking data sets taking parallel data sets and trying to cluster the uh, cluster the objects within those parallel data sets all these parallel data sets all represent the same object that's why you have them you have a parallelism there by way of the object id and you can think of multi-view retrieval you can think of multi-view dimensionality reduction and so on so these are all very well explored areas within multi-view learning and also there are there are kind of uh, newer areas which are like multi-view anomaly detection can you de can you detect anomalies um, better by using multiple views rather than uh, just using one view and then you could have multi-view data completion which is also a fairly in, uh, a fairly emerging area these days so let's look at the problem of multi-view multi-view learning <clears throat> and unsupervised learning tasks of a multi-view data there are a bunch of supervised learning tasks as well but which we will not look at for the moment each of these views is a separate data set okay and the learning can be done separately on each for each of these views you can simply cluster the questions if you think of question answers as multi-view data set you can simply cluster the question separately cluster the answer separately and they lead to some kind of meaningful clusters as well but the question is whether we can leverage the availability of two views to perform the task better than doing separately on each view okay so that's the results of the task using conventional unimodel, unimodel methods become baselines and which is which is a very important and useful thing uh, here because many a time uh, we, we kind of struggle for baselines, right? So so if you're looking at a multi-view uh, task which is rarely explored, you already have trivial baselines which are the uni-view uni tasks of those 
um, UniView manifestations of those tasks. So you could have view view a view one clustering. If you're doing a clustering task, you could have view one clustering as a baseline, view two clustering as another baseline, and the clustering over the concatenated view one view two data as yet another baseline. However, we would, we might want to like we might want to build something like a view one two clustering method that can outperform all of the above. So let's look at the visual interpretation of this. So you have view one data and view two data. Here I've represented only two data objects and the first object in view one corresponds to the first object in view two as well. But in reality, in multi-view data sets, you would have uh, hundreds and hundreds and even millions of objects in certain cases. So you take, um, uh, you, you apply the uni model, uni view, ba uni view baseline algorithm on view one data and you get some results. You apply the um, uni, uni view baseline algorithm on view two data, you get another set of results and you can concatenate these two views and form and, and trivially form a joint uni view data set and you, and you get a yet another set of results. So that should be baseline number three and not baseline number two as I've indicated there. It's a little type on the slide. Now the focus is, can we use the, can we, can we understand the intricacies of these views and combine them in a manner so as uh, so as to outperform all of these all of these baselines so baseline one baseline two and baseline three so that is the focus of multi-view learning uh, if you want to well, think of it that way so let's look at the high level idea you might want to understand the nature of the different views and if necessary you might want to model the similarity between within each data views differently so if you have a time series data in view one, you might want to use the, you might want to use a particular similarity measure that is uh, that is uh, inspired by dy dynamic time warping. Um, whereas if you have a text similarity matrix, then you might a uh, text similarity view textual view, then you might want to do a textual similarity like um, a word embedding, so document embeddings, etc. And you might want to fuse the similarity signals from across the different views using the cross view connections as well, right? So you might want to um, you might want to kind of have some have some kind of uh, domain tuned ways of fusing the signals as well for example um, the domain might tell you that uh, the first view is more reliable than the other so in cases of serious conflict you go you go to the first view and so on and so forth <clears throat> so you might want to um, fuse them in a domain or task tailored way uh, so let's look at some conceptual models of multi view multi view data and one of the one of the earliest models of, of multi view data um, processing in the general multi view sense was from NIPS, NIPS 2005 mm, and there they look at text and image as two uh, as, as a multi view data set so you have text representation and image representation right and you might have a you might have a latent space and they model a latent space which could be thought of as some kind of a conceptual uh, conceptual space okay so that is a bad image of a dog but that's meant to be so because it's just a concept of a dog and you might have a textual manifestation of it which is the which is the word dog uh, comprising the characters dog and you might have an image manifestation of it which is a picture of a dog mm -hmm. right and you might want to um, uh, model the transformations from this latent space x um, uh, through um, uh, through a set of parameters uh, theta y and another set of parameters theta z for the text and the image views respectively and you might want to uh, kind of um, um, talk about a particular uh, kind of optimization problem which is about estimating these parameters theta y theta z as well as x uh, using using basically an optimization formulation. So and then um, and let's look at a simple example here to here to kind of ground the idea. So you might uh, so you're you're looking at these two view data sets and uh, the, uh, these are these are the the blue ones are uh, are already observed. So you have view one which is observed, view two that is observed. You're trying to learn um, a, a, a view a, a shared space or a latent space which is basically yet another view, okay, such that if you take the metrics from that view, the metrics is basically uh, the rows are the, are the data objects and the columns are the attributes and the columns are basically some kind of attributes or the other. And uh, you might want to represent um, uh, the, the transformation from that shared Latin space into this one, um, well, which in, uh, by means of a metrics multiplication, for example. So in which case you might not need to need to have these directed arrows, but then uh, let's let's uh, ignore that for the moment. Um, so you take that x, you take that data set, which is basically a matrix, and you multiply it by uh, the left hand side matrix, and you get uh, this view one data set, and you multiply it by the second side matrix, and you get the view two data set. So here, what we have observed is view one and view two data sets, and we are trying to and we are trying to estimate the sh the latent the latent observation the uh, not the observation the latent matrix as well as the transformation matrices the left and right transformation matrices that will yield this uh, that will yield these two data sets 
okay so that will give us our shared latent space and then um, as, uh, so that is what um, uh, shared latent spaces mean um, uh, so and then in AI Stats 2010, uh, people said that it's not just enough to have a shared Latin space because now all the load um, into into grounding that concept into text or image is 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 delegated to the to the transformation part of it. However, they argued that you might want to have a text Latin space which kind of captures the captures the captures the kind of ways in which text data is expressed. And you might have an image latent space which captures the kind of ways in which image data is uh, expressed and that is the image generator this is the concept so both of them fuse together and and generate the and generate the image for the concept so it's it's conceptually a very simple and a very elegant kind of representation but however the optimization is of course uh, very um, uh, uh, but not so not so trivial and you can look up this this paper called factorized orthogonal latin spaces uh, from ai stats 2010. so moving on so um, well, since since 2010 or, or since the uh, since the um, uh, well early part of this decade or maybe even later last decade, and there has been an emergence of deep learning and so on, right? So there is a there is a lot of work on deep multi-view learning as well. So here you might have a feed-forward network which feeds the input at the bottom and gets and gets all the way to the top, um, and you might have an auto encoder, for example, which is uh, basically a network like this. And you might want to, uh, and, and there have been people who, who kind of said that we will have this two view data and put the two view data into an auto encoder and enforce that the middle, that the middle layer is actually a shared representation. So the middle layer is shared across these two views. These two auto encoders share the middle layer, but everything else is separate. So the transformations are all separate. Transformations as in the weights are all separate from the other things, but the representation in the middle is forced to be the same across the two views. So this kind of captures the intuition of the shared latent space and so on. And uh, people have looked at bimodal deep belief networks, um, bimodal deep Boltzmann machines and so on. And you can find a C++ library for multimodal deep learning uh, from from this paper, if you look at uh, um, the um, well, if you just search for this title, you should be able to reach that paper. It's called a C plus plus library for multimodal deep learning. So, um, so that is a brief um, uh, brief overview of multi view learning, and that I think is is kind of important because uh, QA processing is is one specific kind of multi view learning uh, in the in, in the the space where. Um, the view one is is a question is a question kind of uh, data view two is a answer kind of data and uh, both of them are textual uh, expressed in text so that brings us to the end of this video and in the next video we will look at some research challenges in CQA processing and maybe some data sets for CQA processing and so on